We're going to go to Luke chapter 24, and we will not be long. And, um, but I hope, I do want to be a blessing to you in just a few moments, uh, in the few minutes that we'll take with this tonight. Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 30 through 36. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. I'm not going to preach on missions tonight. Uh, this church is a model church when it comes to missions. So I hope you are encouraged and blessed by what you saw from missions. You know, I know you'll keep doing that. So this is just going to be just a regular message just for uh, all of us tonight. I actually preached this uh, during COVID in Madagascar. And I want to talk preach for just a few minutes tonight on this thought, three truths from Emmaus. Three truths from Emmaus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we don't just stop and ask your blessing upon the preaching at this time, just out of habit. But Lord, we've already asked for it. We ask you one more time to give us your, your, your spirit at work in our hearts, to, to put a calm upon our minds, Lord, and hearts. And Lord, may we get something from your word that will help us and stick with us uh, for, uh, throughout life. Even if they forget the message or who preached it, Lord, I pray that the truth from your word, when they read this passage in the Bible, Lord, that they will remember the truth uh, from your word that will help them, Lord, and help us in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name and amen. I think it's probably difficult for us to really read the Bible with the full appreciation of what the different people were going through or experiencing at the time. I mean, can, you really, can we really understand what Job was going through when he lost everything just about in one day. I mean, you know, can we really put ourselves in his shoes and really uh, go through that day as he did? Can we really, uh, really understand what it was like for Noah to step to, 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 to build the ark and then to go into the ark and then to step out of the ark on the, on the, onto the earth and you're, you're just, there are only eight people left in this world? And what was it like for Moses and Daniel and Peter and others? And, you know, honestly, folks, sometimes it's easy for us to be harsh or critical as we read their stories in the Bible. Okay, we, we make really good Monday morning quarterbacks, don't we? You know, we look at these people and say, well, man, how come they didn't see that? Or how come they didn't know that? Or why didn't they do that? Or what were they thinking? But, you know, if God wrote our stories, the stories of our lives, you know, it's different in the moment, isn't it? It's always easy to sit back afterwards, and hindsight is twenty twenty. but when you're in the moment, things are not easy all the time. And it's easy to be hard on the disciples. How could you deny Christ, Peter? You know, why weren't you waiting at the tomb on Sunday morning? Didn't you hear what he said? Um, you know, didn't you, how could you not understand? How could you quit on God? How about this one? How could you fall asleep at a prayer meeting? <laughs> you know, let me ask these things. But, you know, honestly, you know, Jesus was hard on the disciples too at times. But he was also very, very gracious and compassionate when their humanity showed. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I have a gracious and merciful God when my humanity shows. Because right. it's going to show. Yep. And, when I, and it shows and it, who I am and, and what I am. I'm glad that God is gracious. Now this is one of the accounts that is unique to the Gospel of Luke. You don't find this story in the other three Gospels. Luke, if you know anything about Luke, he gives his accounts in vivid detail. And it's, it's great to me that the Lord gave us his word. He gave it to us, but he didn't take out the personality of the writers. Luke was a doctor, and so he wrote vividly like a doctor would. And um, so he talks about these two men. Let's go to verse number 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which is from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. 
And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are set? Now we don't know who these men were. We know one of them was named Cleopas. We don't know the name of the other. Um, you know, for sure, uh, they were part of the 120. Uh, they probably were two of the 70 that Jesus sent out. But exactly who they were, we don't know, but they were disciples of Christ. Now, Emmaus was a town located about seven miles west of Jerusalem. Now, we don't do a lot of walking in the States. You know, I'll tell you how bad it is. I'm staying in the Provost Chamber, and I drove my car up to the parking lot here and parked it close so I, wouldn't have to carry, so I wouldn't have to walk all the way to church tonight. You know, that's how we are in the States, right? You know, we don't do a lot of walking. But when you're, but in that time, you know, they, they did a lot of walking. And, and a seven-mile walk is a pretty good hike. But I'm going to tell you something. A seven-mile walk is a long walk when you're discouraged. And these men, when they walked that seven-mile walk to, to, to Emmaus, they were low. They had forsaken all and followed Christ. They had given up careers and professions. Let's not be too hard on them. No doubt they had borne the scorn and rejection of many. The Jewish, you know, they had spent three years in complete dedication to Christ, to Christ. They had believed in Him as the Messiah and even went out preaching that He had, the Messiah ha had come. The kingdom of God was at hand and, and, and this was not a game to them. They were sincere. They were all in. A few weeks ago, they had seen Jesus raise a man from the dead. A week ago, <coughs> they had entered into Jerusalem and they had seen the streets lined with coats and palm trees. And they had heard the people cry out, Hosanna! Now that's not a term of praise per se. That means, uh, oh, save us! And that was the cry, the battle cry of the Maccabeans between, before Jesus Christ was born. And they led the revolts against the Greeks and the Romans. And so when they said, Hosanna, oh, save us, they thought that the Jesus Christ had come to save them from Rome. Yeah. And so these men thought, man, we, 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 we borne the scorn and, and the mockery and we followed Christ and it's been difficult. But now, finally, the day's here. And then the bottom fell out. And their lives were in upheaval. In one day, they saw their beloved Messiah crucified and buried. They scattered and fled, fearing for their lives. The group of 12 was in utter chaos. I mean, who could be trusted? They knew there was one traitor, Judas, Iscariot. Were there more? Would they be next? Would they die? And this is where they were. Peter and at least six others were a doubting, discouraged mess. I mean, I mean, was Jesus a liar? Had they been deceived? How could God allow this to happen? What was God doing? And what should they do next? That was a long walk to Emmaus. I want to ask you tonight, have you ever been on that long walk to Emmaus? You see, they said, they told Jesus later, they said, we supposed. We supposed. We trusted that it had been He which should have been redeemed Israel. So what they had envisioned didn't happen. You ever had that happen? You thought, you know, I'm, this is not gone like I thought it, was, it would go. Moses was there. Then he got to Egypt. He said, God, what am I doing here? They don't even want me here. Um, Joseph was like that. He saw the dream and ended up being a slave and then in prison in Egypt. You think Joseph ever wondered, God, what are you doing? How about Paul? You want to talk about a disaster prayer letter to write for your, his third missionary journey, that term on the field, you know? I mean, shipwreck. He, I mean, he ended up in Rome, but it wasn't the way he thought it would, it would go. How about Mary? I mean, maybe you knew something was coming, but you didn't know it was going to be that bad. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, they told her that a sword was going to pierce through her heart also. 
So she knew something was going to happen. She knew some sorrow was going to come. I don't think she knew that she was going to have to watch her son beaten and scourged and crucified like that. I don't, know she, I, don't, I don't think she knew it was going to be that bad. Has the bottom ever fallen out suddenly? Have you ever, have you ever been blindsided? Has life ever taken an unexpected turn? Have blue skies and radiant sunshine ever turned into a stormy day, a stormy night without warning? Have things ever not gone according to plan? Have you ever wondered, how did I end up here? <laughs> Anyone else out there like me? Or maybe one or several of those things have happened in your life? And you're on that road to Emmaus? Folks, there's a reason that God has put this account in Scripture. Because those, are going, those things are going to happen in life. When the way we think, we think things are going to go is not how they're going to go all the time. The way we've planned it out is not going to happen that way sometimes. And so, but I want to, I want to say this. The reason why God put this in the Scripture is, is to encourage us because those men took that same road back from Emmaus to Jerusalem that night, but it wasn't the same road. Because on the way they were low and walking and, and, and in doubt and discouraged. But on the way back, I imagine they were running back to tell the disciples that everything they had believed was true. You see, they found three truths in Emmaus. I want to give them quickly, quickly to you now. It will be done. Number one, they found this truth. The Lord is still with you. Verse number 15, And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. These men were not aware of it at the time, but the very same Jesus whom they had believed on and loved and followed uh, just a, a, a few days earlier, they had seen Him raise the dead, they had seen Him enter Jerusalem, that very same Jesus was walking down the Emmaus road with them. They just didn't realize it. And child of God, if there is anything you and I can be sure of, it is the presence of Jesus Christ at all times. When the Lord accepts us into the family, we're part of the beloved, we're in the, in the family, and Jesus will never, ever leave us nor forsake us. And we may not always see what's happening and, and whatever, but I guarantee you, when you find yourself walking down that road to Emmaus, there's one thing you can be sure of. You may not see Him. You may not be aware of His presence, but the Lord is with you. He's not left you just because you're on the road to Emmaus. He's a friend that's taken closer than a brother. I'm telling you something. When Job was there in the trials of life, the Lord was with him. He may, he may not have sensed it. He may have said, God, where are you? But the Lord was aware of what was going on in Job's life. And the Lord was aware when Moses went down to Egypt and said, God, where are you? You ever struggled in ministry? The Lord's there. How about Jacob at the ford, the brook Jabbok, when God changed his name to Israel? Now, you know what? If there was ever a family in the Bible that was a mess, it was that family. You know what Jacob found? The Lord was with him. I'm talking about whether it's the trials of life or tr struggles in ministry or family difficulties. The Lord is there. How about Joshua facing a new uh, challenge at Jericho, a battle, the unknown, walking, leaping, stepping out into the unknown. I saw that car leave today. And I remembered what that was like. Getting on the plane and going overseas with a one-way ticket. The unknown. Yeah, I'm telling you, I've been there. It's scary. But you know what Joshua found? The Lord was with him. And you know what they're going to find? The Lord's with him. Because he's there. How about discouragement? You ever been discouraged? Elijah was. And when he found in the cave, God was still with him. And God didn't get all over his case and kick him to the curb because he was discouraged. God just said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Get up. 
and get back out there and get in the fight. How about Peter on the shore of Galilee? He needed a second chance, didn't he? You ever needed a second chance? I have. You ever feel like, man, I have really blown it? Maybe you haven't. God didn't abandon him. Jesus went and got him. How about Paul at Corinth? You know, it's interesting to me that Paul got to Corinth and the Lord stood by him and appeared to him. You know what the Lord said? Fear not. Does that not sound odd to you? Thomas, someone else, but Paul, who had been stoned to death and resurrected, <laughs> who had been beaten, Paul was afraid? You know, I don't know. But I don't think that Paul was afraid of the people in Corinth. I think he got to a really dark place. Corinth was a dark place spiritually. You, you, you go to Madagascar, some of these places in the last of the places we're talking about today, and, and, and there, is a, there is an oppression and a darkness that's felt. You know where he was just coming from? Athens. And Athens was the worst and most unfruitful place in his missionary journey, on his missionary journey. I don't know. Maybe Paul wondered, God, are you still with me? Are you still going to use me? I don't know. But I'm going to tell you this. When you're on the road to Emmaus, don't abandon God. Don't abandon your Bible. Don't abandon your church. Don't abandon your faith in the Lord just because you can't sense His presence. Whether you sense His presence or not, He's there. Number two. The Lord is still working. Look at verse number 25. And they told him, oh, it's terrible. We thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't understand what's happening. It, you know, it's terrible. What did Jesus say in verse 25? Oh, fools. You think your pastor is rough on you? I doubt he's ever said that. I called you a fool or a viper. Oh, fools. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. These men were discouraged because they did not understand what God was doing, but everything that had happened was all according to God's plan. All of it. They didn't see the whole plan. They didn't understand the plan. But just because they didn't realize what was going on didn't mean that God was not in control. And child of God, just because we don't always understand or see what God is doing doesn't mean that God doesn't understand what He is doing. And we're going to have to have faith that, you know what, at this time, I'm on the road to Emmaus, but God is still in control, and He is still working. God is working during the good times, and God is working during the bad times. God is working on the mountaintops, and God is still working in and during and through the deepest and darkest valleys. God is working when it's smooth sailing, and God is still working on the stormy seas. And by the way, God, shan't, God can't show His skill without the storm. My dad talked about that. He got on the plane. It was the last flight going out of the Chicago airport before they closed it because of the snow and the weather. People were on the plane. It was tense. It was tight. It was quiet. They're looking out. There's like a bunch of snow on the ground. There's snow on the wings. There's snow everywhere. It's windy. It's blowing. And before the flight took off, the pilot came out of the cabin and stood in the front of the plane. And he said, folks, we've got some bad weather out there. He said, but I want you to know, we're going to take off. And once we get out of this in Chicago, where we're going is beautiful weather. And he said, you know, we're going to get there. This is not my first time in this sort of thing. You just sit back and relax. I know, you, I know it's tense. But we're going to be fine. It was just like, Whew. but you know what? He had to go through 
some storms before he, he, could, he could get to that point. And it took a storm for him to say, hey, I've got this. And it's the same thing for the Lord. <clears throat> God is always working, and it's always working for our good and his glory. Example is David, God anointed him, Samuel anointed him, and then he killed Goliath, and then his life was just in chaos. And while the kingdom was falling apart under Saul, God was building a king. And someone said, when it seems like everything is falling apart, everything is falling into place. Now I want to say this lastly. The Lord is not only still with us, and He is not only still working, but He is still willing. Amen. Look at verse 28. And they drew nigh unto the village, <clears throat> whither they went, and He made as though He would have gone further. But they constrained Him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And He went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass as He sat at meat. With them He took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. Wow. And to think, he would have kept on going. But for those men saying, hey, come on in. Say this a little bit. Folks, I understand the day seems dark. But that doesn't mean that God is done working. And if you're willing, <clears throat> God is still willing. You know what that tells me? If you're willing to sit down in the morning and open God's Word, and you're willing to say, Lord, please speak to me this morning. He's willing to speak to you. And if you're saying, Lord, help me to have the marriage and the home that you want us to have, He's willing. If you come to church and say, Lord, please use your man and speak to my heart, He's willing. You know, the Bible says that the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. And then it said, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim. And then it said, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. You know what that means? In that dark day, the Lord was still speaking to that man. And if we're willing for God to speak with us and fellowship, speak to us and fellowship with us and use us and bless us, He's willing. We don't have to be victims of the day or the circumstances. On the road to Emmaus. You're all, we're all going to be there at one point. When you're on that road, you remember God's still with you. He's still working. And He is still willing if you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would please use your word. It's a very simple message. Very simple. Maybe too simple. I don't know. But Lord, I, hope, I, I, I pray and ask you to use your word in our hearts tonight. And let me it be a challenge and a blessing and encouragement to us. We ask this in Jesus' name and amen. Let's stand the piano to play. The altar is open. The message has been given to you. You need to respond to the Holy Spirit. Why don't you come right now? You're in the house of prayer on Wednesday night. You have some personal prayer requests that you just need to come bring before the Lord and cast your care upon him knowing that he careth for you.